What is going on? Today we're going to be talking acute bronchitis. Now, the reason why I want to touch on this topic is because regardless of the specialty that you're in, you're going to encounter a patient that has cough. Now, bronchitis, right? We have, we're talking about acute bronchitis. We also have something called chronic bronchitis and chronic bronchitis is part of COPD. Here, we're talking acute. Acute means we have an infectious process going on, right? So this is the patient that has inflammation of the bronchi. This is the lower respiratory tract due to an upper respiratory infection. Again, do not confuse this with chronic bronchitis. Now, if the infection spreads further into the bronchioles and into the alveoli, and at that point, we have bronchopneumonia, right? So we have acute bronchitis, not to be confused with chronic bronchitis, infection of the lower respiratory tract, usually starting from up from the upper respiratory tract, spreading downwards. And if it continues to spread to the bronchioles and to the alveoli, remember, this is now called bronchopneumonia. Now, in order to really have acute bronchitis, the cough has to be present for five days, right? Minimum of five days. And it's usually gonna be a viral infection in nature. Now, what does this mean? This means that we do not need antibiotics. Here's a little caveat though. In clinical practice, you're often going to see providers, clinicians, doesn't matter if they're a physician, a PA, or a nurse practitioner, oftentimes you're going to see z packs given. This is simply azithromycin, right? Now, I would be lying if I said that I've never done this myself, and there are a couple reasons as to why some clinicians feel like uh, it might be appropriate. And according to UpToDate, it's estimated that 60 to 90% of patients that are coming into the clinic with an acute bronchitis are given antibiotics. This means we have overprescription of antibiotics. This then further uh, leads to antibiotic resistance down the line. So let's quickly touch on why this happens. For the most part, it's typically to appease the patient, right? We know that normally this is gonna be a viral uh, etiology. Viral etiology never responds to antibiotics. Antibiotics are for bacteria, pretty basic. But for some patients believe with all their heart that they are not going to get better unless they are given antibiotics. It's also known, like we discussed earlier, that antibiotics are going to promote antibiotic resistance. So this is a problem, right? So I'm gonna give you two, two, ways, or two uh, ways to view this. On your exam, you are never going to give antibiotics. It's never the right answer and it should never be done. In clinical practice, you're gonna see it all the time. And some patients believe this so much, believe the fact that they won't get better without the antibiotics, that in fact, they may even come back and appear worse, right? So this puts you in a predicament because now you have an angry patient. Now, I'm not condoning this and I'm not saying you should or shouldn't. What I'm saying is that the mind is very powerful. And in the same way, the placebo effect can make a patient feel better. Not receiving the medication can also uh, do the reverse and make the patient feel worse. So just some things to keep in mind, right? And according to the CDC and the American College of Physicians, um, really the only, uh, according to them, really the only uh, type of bronchitis or etiology of bronchitis, I should say, that should be treated with antibiotics is going to be pertussis, right? This is really the only indication for antibiotics. Now, like we said, the majority of cases of acute bronchitis are going to be viral. Typically, most commonly, we're gonna be talking about influenza A, influenza B, para-influenza, coronavirus, rhinovirus, and RSV. Now, the only bacteria that have been isolated in acute bronchitis are going to be mycoplasma pneumoniae, chlamydia pneumoniae, and pertussis. Now, mycoplasma is typically gonna present like a viral infection, right? We're gonna have pharyngitis, congestion, headache, cough, and it's believed to be the culprit in less than 1% of cases, so not all that much. Chlamydia can be seen in up to 5% of cases and is going to present with pharyngitis, cough, laryngitis, fever, and hoarseness. Nothing really spectacular about this. This often presents like a viral etiology, pharyngitis, cough, laryngitis, right? Even though it's a bacterial etiology. Now, Bordetella pertussis, right? This is also known as whooping cough. This is only seen in, up to, in about 1% of cases, uh, patients, I should say. And those that have partial immunity, again, are going to present identical to that of a viral etiology. 
The real only difference here is going to be the prolonged length of cough. They can last up to, uh, it can last about two weeks, right? Minimum. And we have this inspiratory whoop that happens and we have this post-tussive emesis that happens. However, they're really poor indicators for the diagnosis. They are great for board review. They're great for your exams because you have this inspiratory whoop. All right, we're thinking pertussis. Or we have vomiting after coughing, we're thinking pertussis. But the reality of the situation is in clinical practice, it's very, very difficult to distinguish between having a bacterial etiology versus a viral. As you notice, they present very, very similarly. So now let's get into the actual signs and symptoms, right? The main symptom, like we said, is going to be cough. And it's got to be present for at least five days. Now, it may or may not have sputum, right? It used to be that if you have a productive cough, this is bacterial. Really, the presence of sputum does not correlate. It does not mean that we have a bacterial etiology. And again, the color of the sputum also does not matter. It doesn't matter what color it is. It doesn't identify this as bacterial or viral. And homoptysis can be seen in up to... Um, can also be seen in acute bronchitis, and this is actually going to be the most common cause of homoptysis, right? So just because we have homoptysis, a lots of students especially go and think pneumonia or think something incredibly dangerous. And quite honestly, the most common cause of homoptysis is acute bronchitis. So no need to worry. So now let's get into this, right? If the patient has only been symptomatic for a few days, again, it's gonna be very, very difficult to differentiate this between a URI. And in all honesty, it doesn't matter because the management is really gonna be the same. Really, the chlamydia, mycoplasma, pertussis even, for the most part, these are often gonna resolve on their own without medication, right? The main differential that we really wanna take a look at here is going to be pneumonia because pneumonia does require antibiotic uh, therapy. And the main distinction here is going to be the presence of a high fever. Now, fever can be present in both, right? It's gonna be more prominent in pneumonia, but you can still have a low-grade fever in acute bronchitis. If we're talking about board review, if we're talking about the exam, they're never going to give you a patient with cough and fever and expect you to choose bronchitis. If they give you fever in the stem, you're thinking pneumonia. In clinical practice, you can have a low-grade fever with acute bronchitis, right? But if you have high fever in both scenarios, whether you're talking about board review or you're talking about clinical practice, high fever, you should start to think about pneumonia. So high fever, productive, productive cough and malaise, we're thinking pneumonia, right? And or if we're in the season, influenza. Now, wheezing can be present in both bronchitis and pneumonia, so it's not necessarily gonna be all that useful. And it's characteristic to hear this ronchi in, the, in bronchitis and it's going to clear after coughing. If you do the physical exam, right? We're really doing the physical exam because we want to make sure that we don't have a possibility of pneumonia. So what are some things that are going to clue us into pneumonia, right? Well, if we have dullness to percussion, decreased breath sounds, rails, agophony, um, or even a pleural friction rub, this can indicate pneumonia. And the cough and bronchitis can last up to three weeks. So this is very common. You're going to have a patient that comes in. They're going to, be, they're going to uh, have acute bronchitis, viral etiology. They're going to come by three, four days later, five days later, and say, I still have a cough. When you examine and ask the questions, they're going to give you a history that they are improving, but the cough is still there. This is normal. The cough will persist for up to three weeks. This does not mean that the patient requires antibiotic therapy. Now, moving on to, I just want to, just a quick little blurb here, asthma. Please don't confuse acute bronchitis with asthma. Please don't tell your patients that they have asthma simply because they come in with cough, shortness of breath, and wheezing. Acute bronchitis causes cough, shortness of breath, and wheezing. This does not mean that they have asthma, and this happens all the time. The patient has an infection, this causes bronchospasm, and it's going to present with the same symptoms as asthma. So what's the difference? Well, when the infection clears, these symptoms clear as well. If you're really worried about this pro uh, the possibility of asthma, get a good history, and then you can do pulmonary function testing after the illness has resolved, if you're worried. All right, so do we really need any type of testing? 
Well, the truth is acute bronchitis is a clinical diagnosis. We don't need a chest x-ray. We don't need any type of culture. The only reason why you would do a chest x-ray is if you're thinking that the patient might have pneumonia. But even then, I would honestly argue, is the chest x-ray even necessary? Especially if you have a young, healthy adult, I probably wouldn't go straight to a chest x-ray. The only uh, indication, I guess you could say, for imaging is if they have these uh, red flags that might indicate either a very severe type of pneumonia and or if the patient is elderly. But really, I wouldn't even do a chest x-ray. If you suspect pneumonia, go straight to therapy, start the antibiotics. So what are some indications for imaging? Well, if you have tachycardia, if you have a respiratory rate over 24, if you have fever, rails, or signs of consolidation, um, then at this point, we might think of doing a chest x-ray. And again, remember, the elderly, the elderly are very frail. They don't mount fevers. So if you suspect uh, pneumonia, start antibiotic therapy and even have a lower threshold for pneumonia in the elderly. Um, these patients can get very, very sick very, very quickly. Again, no cultures. Remember, this is more likely a viral etiology in nature. We're not going to be able to culture any type of uh, a viral infection. And lastly, the main thing or the, the big topic that is often discussed is procalcitonin. Um, you know, there have been studies regarding procalcitonin and its correlation with bacterial infections. I personally have never ordered uh, procalcitonin levels. Um, the way the procalcitonin is used, though, however, is if you have a bacterial infection, right? If you have a bacterial infection, the procalcitonin is going to be released from tissues because of direct stimulation. If you have a viral infection, then this seems to reduce the amount of calcitonin in the serum. Uh, by interferon gamma that's released with a viral infection. So there is a correlation in these studies that have demonstrated um, procalcitonin and pneumonia, whether or uh, bronchitis, whether that's a bacterial and viral etiology in nature. Would I order it? Honestly, I really don't see the point because this is a, a, a clinical diagnosis. If you suspect you have pneumonia, if you suspect pertussis, honestly, go straight to therapy, give the antibiotics. And if you're unsure, but you have an elderly patient, honestly, just lean towards the antibiotic. Much, uh, It's better to be safe than sorry. If you're unsure and you don't have any way of doing a chest x-ray in office um, and or uh, you know any way of kind of clenching the diagnosis immediately. So always err on the side of uh, caution, I would say. So how do we treat, right? We say antibiotics, but for the most part, like we said, acute bronchitis is going to be viral. You're really going to be focusing on the symptoms. But here's what happens. What's the main symptom for acute bronchitis? It's going to be cough. If you look at the literature, cough suppressants are not going to be recommended. And even according to all the data, they say that they don't work, right? Dextromethorphan, promethazine, they don't work. But I still give them. And for the most part, I typically give promethazine with dextromethorphan because it seems to work the best. And here's the reason why I give cough suppressants despite the large amount of data that says that they don't work because the patients want something, right? They want to know that you're trying. I want you to put yourself in the patient's shoes for one second. You have a cough. It's not letting you sleep. It's not letting you breathe. You hear this funny whistling coming out of your chest. You go to your primary care. They say it's viral in nature. Um, antibiotics don't work. Antitussives don't work. Mucolytics don't work. Albuterol doesn't work. Antihistamines don't work because there's really no evidence of any of this working. So what do you do? Do you just send the patient home? Do you have them do any type of nasal irrigation if they also have congestion to kind of clear up all that mucus uh, buildup that they have? Do they try a humidifier? Um, air purifier, you know, give them something. They'll feel better. It, it, it'll, it'll appease them, I promise you. And again, there's really no evidence to this. There's no evidence to mucolytics, but I still give guaifenesin. I still give promethazine. Um, if they have a really, really severe cough, I will do the promethazine with codeine. Um, now, the one exception that I would say is if they have wheezing, then this means we do have narrowing of the airway. So I, in this scenario, I would say prescribe albuterol. If you have acute bronchitis without any type of wheezing, 
then albuterol is not going to do anything. But if you have bronchospasm, if you have narrowing of the airways, you have audible wheezes, albuterol will help in this situation. Now, antibiotics are never going to be used, right? The only real indication for antibiotic use is going to be for the treatment of pertussis. And we have a different, uh, we have a couple of different regimens that we can use. We can do erythromycin 500 milligrams four times a day for two weeks. Honestly, I don't know why you would give erythromycin for two weeks, but that is um, one of the uh, therapies available. You can also do clarithromycin twice a day, which is better than four times a day. But again, it's still going to be two weeks. And this is the reason why you're often going to see Z-packs and azithromycin given, right? Because azithromycin has such a long half-life, you can do 500 milligrams the first day, followed by 250 milligrams once a day for four days. This makes azithromycin very, very easy to dose. It's a five-day regimen, right? Remember, erythromycin can cause QT prolongation. And because of this regimen, azithromycin is also going to be preferred over the others. Now, the last thing that I do want to talk about is the elderly patient. And antibiotic therapy might be warranted in those patients who are over 65, if they've been hospitalized in the last year, if they're on chronic steroids, if they have diabetes, or if they have congestive heart failure. Also think about giving antibiotics in those patients who are immunocompromised, or if they're at high risk for complications, and especially those patients who are over 80 years of age, these patients are very, very high risk. Honestly, if the patient comes in, they're 85 years old, and they have a productive cough, I'm giving the antibiotic. It's just safer in my opinion. So this was the lecture on acute bronchitis. I really hope this helps you guys. I really hope that you guys took something from this. Remember, it's very, very difficult to figure out in clinical practice if you have a viral etiology versus a bacterial etiology. But in all honesty, it doesn't matter. The management is the same. Supportive therapy and antibiotics only in the specific indications that we mentioned. Azithromycin is by far going to be the safer um, of the macrolides and it's going to be easily dosed as well. The only time you should really give albuterol is if the patient presents with wheezing. And the last big takeaway here is that the cough in bronchitis can last up to three weeks. That concludes today's uh, video topic, podcast topic. If you guys have any questions, if you guys want me to do any type of topic review, please either DM me on my personal Instagram, that's A and D underscore R-E-I-D, or you can DM the PA Boards Instagram, that's P-A-B-O-A-R-D-S, or you can always email me, Andrew at physicianassistantboards.com. If you guys are listening on the podcast, I would really, really appreciate a rating or a review. This really helps us climb the ranks um, on iTunes. This way, we can continue to be found on iTunes, um, and this way, it can be enjoyed by more people. If you guys are seeing this for the first time on YouTube, please subscribe and let me know if you like this video or not. Thank you guys so much, and I'll check you on the next uh, on the next topic. Take care, guys. Bye.